Hey guys, how's it going? I hope you're doing well and welcome to another Solo Fall Baits video. In this one we're going to be making something a little bit different, um, for me at least, which is going to be a multi-jointed uh, shad type swim bait. So let's get started. Okay, so what I have here is a piece of maple that I'm going to be using for this project. And this is actually going to be just a master that I'm going to be turning into a resin cast lure later on. But let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. First I need to transfer the shape into this piece of maple. So now that the lure is still a nice block, uh, it's pretty easy to get a straight hole through the lure, which will act as my uh, pilot hole for the eye sockets, which I will be doing later on. So you might have seen me do this on other swim baits, if you follow me on social medias and whatnot where I make uh, the tail section a bit more, should I say, fancier. Um, not necessarily better, but just, you know, a little bit easier for me. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Let me just mark it out here first and I'll uh, explain a little bit later on why I decided to do it this way. So the plan here is to make a circular hole on the back side of the tail slot. And what that will do is it will actually help me lock in the tail a little bit easier. And actually, if I was uh, thinking of being a little bit more fancier than I am actually going to be, I would make a pressure fit. You could make a pressure fit tail so easily with this method, but that's something that I need to work on a little bit later and uh, work out the kinks. All right, let's start bandsawing the shape out with my trusty Ryobi bandsaw. And I know a lot of people crap on <laughs> Ryobi being not the greatest brand in the world and not having the best quality, but honestly, I have to say for hobbyist use, this bandsaw is perfectly adequate. And you can totally get away with uh, lower end equipment when it comes to, you know, making lures. And of course, you know, more expensive and uh, fancier gear is always nice, but uh, it's not necessary. You can definitely make do with lower uh, tier stuff as well. So just keep that in mind when you start investing on the hobby. And you know, actually a lot of the uh, quality of cuts that you can do with a bandsaw really comes down to how you actually tune the machine itself. So um, that's actually a very good uh, thing to do on your um, equipment. Just uh, learn how it works and go online and see how you're supposed to tune your equipment as well, because that has a lot to do with the quality of the cuts that you will be able to achieve with well, any kind of tool, to be honest. Also at this point I should point out that uh, working with power tools can be dangerous and you want to make sure that you're safe when you're using these machines. So for example, I uh, usually always wear some safety glasses and um, of course I have quite long history when it comes to woodworking so I pretty much know how these machines work and how they behave when they break for example like a bandsaw blade uh, when it breaks it usually just falls into the pit like the the flywheel pit uh, sometimes it might go over the table depending on where the breakage happens but that's not very often and I don't think that's going to be a big issue when it comes to these smaller uh, hobbyist bandsaw blades. Maybe not so much when it uh, comes to those bigger blades where you have like two or three inch of uh, blade thickness and yeah it can be dangerous so uh, make sure that you know how everything works. Might not be a bad idea to go and take a course or um, go into a uh, woodworking class for example and uh, familiarize yourself with all these uh, tools that I use in this uh, video for example. So now that I'm done with the band sewing, you can probably see pretty clearly that the edges are pretty rough and they need to be sanded down so I decided to use my belt sander and disc sander combo to get rid of those 
uh, rough edges. So normally what I would do for a swim bait is I would cut a angled um, joint, which means like 45 degrees, maybe 35 degrees or 25, anything in between. But this time around I'm just going to cut straight lines, which is basically like 90 degree uh, angle cuts. But first uh, I need to mark where those uh, cuts are going to be. And by the way, since I still have your attention, hopefully at this point, I would like to point out that uh, the lures that you see in this video are going to be available to purchase on my website if you're interested in getting one for yourself. And also there's going to be a extended version of this video that you're watching on my Patreon. And that's going to be almost two hours long. It's like one hour and 40 minutes of uh, pure viewing pleasure. Or something. Anyways, uh, just wanted to throw that out there. Alright, so this next step is not super necessary, but I decided to do it anyway to help me out a little bit later on. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make these kind of uh, pre-cuts uh, around the body of the swim bait. Alright, so now that I have the uh, pilot cuts or whatever you want to call these on the backside and the bottom of the swim bait, I'm just gonna repeat that on the flank of the lure as well. At this point I decided, you know what, I'm already cutting stuff and might as well saw the tail slot for the swim bait as well, so that's exactly what I did. This swim bait is fairly thin and I decided, you know what, I'm not going to even bother doing any contour lines or anything like that. I think I'm just going to be able to eyeball that and uh, make it symmetrical just by doing that. And I'm pretty good at eyeballing at this point, actually. And you know what? I think uh, when it comes to eyeballing, um, being slow and methodical is definitely the way to go. You don't want to uh, start hogging off too much material or else you're going to end up with a lopsided lure, which is not what we want here.
As I mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm not going to mark any kind of contour lines or anything like that. I'm just going to go by feel. And for this wind bait, I felt like I wanted to have the top part, or at least the first section of the top part, kind of flat to give it a little bit more of a unique look. Because obviously, everything has been done a thousand times already. So I just wanted to give it at least a little bit of a different kind of look. All right, here we get to the part where I get the most comments of my recklessness or reckless behavior. Uh, but this is actually a very uh, stable and uh, easy way of um, drilling a eye socket hole, at least for me personally. Obviously, if you are not experienced in this sort of thing, probably should not do it like this. Um, but, you know, just throwing that out there, be careful. All right, so now that I'm done with the eye sockets, I'm gonna move on to the back fin and the back fin slot, which will be dovetailed. Um, I usually do this because I'm kind of paranoid of things coming loose, and this will definitely help with the durability. Although um, the rubber that I use for the fins is fairly stiff and probably would not come loose, I just wanna make sure that it definitely doesn't. All right, so now that the back fin slot is um, done, I actually didn't remember to record the last uh, uh, section of that, but yeah, there is a dovetail slot there now. Anyways, we're gonna move on to making the head details next. And as you can probably remember from my previous videos, I, I always start with this kind of like a um, uh, template. Um, actually decided to, uh, change up the um, position of the uh, gill plates and the mouth and uh, kind of the proportions a little bit more from the original thing that I drew. You know, sometimes you have to uh, go with the flow and uh, when something doesn't feel or look right, I just have to change it. So I just keep cutting the template into smaller sections and transferring those uh, details on both sides of the head and make it more uniform looking. And uh, maybe there's somebody out there who's gonna ask this, I'm not sure, um, but um, these uh, templates get destroyed when I make these lures. So unfortunately I can't share these, but then again, it would uh, rob you the uh, opportunity of making your own lure which is basically what I'm trying to teach you guys here. You know, be creative and uh, do things your own way.
Alright, so now that we have the head details all marked out, I'm gonna cut them, start cutting them out. And I usually always use a hobby knife or um, utility knife or whatever you want to call this. This is a 9mm uh, snap-off blade type. And I just always really loved using these because they're super comfortable in my hand. And since I've been using them forever, they just feel like an extension of my arm at this point. Alright, now that I've cut along those lines that I drew on the head of the swim bait, I'm gonna start carving them out with my hobby knife. And I pretty oftenly get asked this question, how do I control the depth of the cuts and how to be more accurate? It's just something you, I don't think you can verbally teach. You just have to uh, practice on it and just keep at it and try to, um, try to uh, kind of familiarize yourself with the, the type of wood that you use for example and also the blade how to control it and how make uh, how to make efficient cuts and um, I think that way you will probably learn how to do this pretty well Now that I have the head details carved out, I'm going to start sanding them down and making those lines and all of that stuff more uh, uniform. And uh, to do that, I have these uh, mini uh, sanding sticks that I made purposely for this sort of thing. And uh, yeah, they work pretty well. Um, it's pretty easy to make one of these yourself. You just need a pointy stick and then you just glue in some... Uh, uh, sanding paper on on the bottom of it and I think I have uh, 150 grit on this particular one here Next I'm gonna mark out where the lateral line is going to be and in order for me to do that accurately I'm gonna use the, the template that I had made for this swim bait and Now that you can see this is uh, completely and utterly destroyed after this so no way for me to share this to anyone But yeah, I'm just gonna use this and it'll be nice and accurate on both sides, which is what we want. So now that I have the lateral line in place, I'm just going to mark every uh, three millimeters a spot on the lateral line and that will be my cross section that I'll be using to help me align the scales a little bit later on. So maybe you have seen this on my channel before where I use this tool to mark out the correct angles for the scale grid pattern. Uh, I did use that in the beginning, but I I just didn't like how it looked. I think it's, it has something to do with the flat surface and uh, the shape of the, the lure. 
it just didn't look good. So I just decided to do it freehand this time around, and I think it worked out pretty well. Now that I have the grid pattern in place, it's easy to draw on the scales. And I have done this before where, actually not on video though, I have to say that, where I actually just ignore this part completely and start carving at this point. But it's a nice thing to have a visual representation of the scales and where they're supposed to be. Now it's time for the tedious part of the whole build, which is carving out the scales. But I do actually kind of enjoy this part. Uh, you get into this kind of zen, or maybe a flow would be more accurate, uh, state of mind when you do this carving. And uh, I think you can probably see it pretty well in here that the, all of the scales are actually not the same size, especially when I go down on the tail. I decided to leave those slightly smaller so that the uh, overall look would be a little bit more realistic. At least I think it worked out pretty well. And here we have some never seen before macro scale carving, which I thought would be a really nice addition to um, showing you guys how to actually carve the scales like really close up. And I gotta say it was really difficult to keep this shot in focus or actually kind of in focus because it keeps going in and out um, because of the focal length here. But um, I think it worked out pretty well and you can see pretty well how I actually carve the scales out. Now that I have everything carved, I'm going to mark out where the lateral line holes are going to be. And I'm just using an owl for that. Alright, so next I'm going to move on to making the fins for this swim bait. And I'm just going to use this 5mm uh, thick piece of maple uh, to do that. And I'm just going to trace out the outlines first. And then we're going to head out to the bandsaw and cut these out.
while I was cutting things on the band, so I decided, you know what, this would be a great time to actually separate the segments on my swim bait. And I did this very, very carefully because any mishap here would cost me a couple of months of work, which would suck real bad. There were a few rough spots left from the sawing, so I headed to the belt sander and took care of those. Alright, so let's get back to the tail. So what I have here is basically a kind of a fancy tenon, uh, which will go into this mortise, or I'm not sure if you could call this a mortise actually, because it's an open uh, design. It goes through the, the swim bait. I don't know, maybe there's somebody out there who's gonna correct me on this, and uh, you would be right to do so, because I'm not really sure. Anyways, what I have here is a peg, that I've rounded off and shaved one of the sides. This will attach to the tail itself with some super glue. While the super glue is still drying, I'm actually going to go ahead and shave off the excess of the peg that I put in here. And that will correspond nicely with the curves of my tail section here. Next I'm going to give the tail a little bit more of a rounded look, uh, especially when it comes to the outer edges. I kind of like that look myself. It's not super necessary, but you know, it's just one of those things that I like to do personally. All right, so moving on with the tail. So next what I'm going to do is I'm going to freehand some uh, bone sections on the edges of the fin. Here I'm starting to um, carve out the bone sections that I was talking about a little bit earlier there. And this is basically exactly the same that I did with the scales and as I did with the head details. Except uh, this is a little bit more easier. Alrighty, so here I'm again shaving off some excess wood, exposing that uh, bone rip that I want to have on this tail. And as you can see here pretty clearly, the uh, position of my thumb and the knife blade going towards it is not optimal, and it's kind of sketchy. So if you want to try this yourself, uh, this is probably not the best way to do it, and you might want to try something else out. But personally, I'm very comfortable doing it this way. I've done it so many times that it's kind of second nature to me already. And I've actually never cut myself while doing this. But I want to leave a warning out there for you guys that this is probably not the best way to go about it. 
So after that speed sanding that I did back there, I'm going to actually start drawing on the rest of the bones here. And I'm doing it exactly the same way I did with the um, outer edges, and I'm just going to freehand them. Here's a little trick for you guys who want to do this kind of carving. So you see that my blade is extended quite a bit from the handle, right? So there's actually a reason for that. This allows me to have a lot more um, control over the cut itself because the blade is able to flex a little bit. Um, this is something that I do quite a bit. It's one of those really nuanced things that I don't think anyone ever uh, mentions uh, in anything, really. But uh, it's something that I do quite a bit, and uh, it really helps you to be a little bit more accurate when you do these kind of like uh, uh, curved cuts. It doesn't really work on scales or anything like that. For those, you need a little bit more stiffer action on the blade itself. But for these kind of cuts, works perfectly. Alright, so here you see what I should have done a little bit earlier there when I did the uh, uh, outer edge bone uh, sections there. I'm actually holding it properly as you should. So if you are just starting out, this is a really good position to have um, when you do this kind of carving. Or what you could also do is you could place this on any kind of surface, uh, probably best if it's kind of like non-slip surface you place it on the surface and you hold on to the piece with the other hand and you carve with your other hand that might also be a very good way of going about it and i think a little bit more safer too i'm pretty decent when it comes to carving out details but still sometimes there's a little bit of rough edges exposed and i want to make them look a little bit more uniform so that's when i bring out the sanding stick and sand the surfaces with those and i think like i mentioned before uh, the grid i use here is 150 but sometimes i do go all the way up to 400 if i want to make sure that uh, i get just tiny amount of uh, material out So if you ever paid attention to what a fish's tail looks up real close, you notice that it has this kind of a flared out section on the end of the bone. And that's what we're doing next. I'm just going to draw out this uh, little piece here to help me um, do the cuts here again. And uh, this will be our kind of flared out section, which won't look hyper realistic or anything like that, but it will give a nice extra added bonus detail. The carving of these small little details is pretty much exactly the same as uh, all the other details that I did on the swim bait so far, so I don't really have much to say about that. Um, I think maybe someday I will be able to make hyper-realistic look when it comes to the tail sections. I'm not there yet, but maybe hopefully someday I will be able to master that as well.
finish off the carving with a diamond file and this is kind of like a triangle shape which will allow me to go deep into the cut and make this look a little bit neater. All right, next I'm going to start uh, marking out the connection points, which will be a pin and a screw eye. So first I'm going to make the, um, the pit or the hole that uh, will accommodate the screw eye. So I marked on both sides of the segment exactly where the pinhole is going to be and I'm just going to use this owl now to mark out the center of those points. Here I'm marking out the outer edges of a hole that I will be making on the opposite side of the screw eye connection, which will accommodate the loop section of the screw eye. In order for me to get an accurate depth on the holes that I will be carving into these swim bait sections, I figured it actually might be easiest for me to just drill them out with a uh, drill first and then um, use a Dremel to take out the middle piece. Like I mentioned a few moments ago, I felt like the easiest way to go about this problem of making the holes would be just to use a Dremel tool with a round tip. And this tip is actually slightly thicker than the gauge of the wire that I use for the uh, screw eyes. Which is kind of what you want, because uh, you will need to have a little bit of movement on the joint itself so it won't lock up so easily. And here you can see how nicely the holes and the screw eyes fit together. And now it's just a matter of uh, making the pinholes. I start by using the screw eye on the opposite side to mark out where the pinhole should be.
and then use a drill to go through the slots and try to be as accurate as I possibly can, which is no easy task, let me tell you. Um, also, I have to note here that these holes actually don't have to meet because, like I said before, we are making a master and I can compensate any inaccuracies in the mold itself. All right, so our master is almost done now. And we just need to add one more little thing, which is going to be the position of the hardware, meaning the internal wire harness and whatnot. And I kind of remember uh, one time there was a guy who was telling me that, hey, that doesn't look very secure. And it doesn't have to be because this is actually just marking out in the mold itself where the internal wire harness is going to be attached to. Uh, this is not the end product, so to speak. Alrighty, let's get back to the garage and start making the mold box, which is something different that I haven't done before, because I usually always used Legos in the past. And I just wanted to switch things up and try something else out, so enjoy this little montage of me making the mold box.
despite my best efforts on keeping the mold box flat, there's a little bit of wobble going on here, which I will have to address now, which might not be an issue later on. I'm not sure, but I just didn't want to take any risks. So I'm just going to have to flatten it out. When I was filling out the mold box the first time, I noticed that, uh, damn it, I don't have enough mold clay. Which led me to go to the garage and cutting out a piece of particle board that I will now just put on the bottom to give me more volume. You know, sometimes you have to just get around these uh, small little issues by just being a little creative. I've always struggled with making the mold boxes completely flat and it's kind of nice to have this rigid uh, structure to help you out with that with nice thick walls to boot. But while I was doing this I also realized that you know what I could have just flipped the Lego mold box upside down and that would have also helped me out with getting the surface completely flat. Oh well at least I had fun making this box so I have no regrets whatsoever. Just as I was about to put the mold uh, master into the mold box, I realized I think I might have some issues here. First of all, these uh, accommodating holes for the uh, screw eyes are pretty difficult to fill with mold silicone. And second of all, even if I was able to make them, they might actually tear off uh, when I pull out the uh, castings. So I decided to make insert pieces instead. And I made this from 3mm thick Lexan. Now that I have the issues taken care of, I can start excavating the uh, hole for the uh, mold master into the mold clay. But first I'm going to mark out the outlines of my swim bait into the mold clay. So the idea here is to submerge, air quotes, the um, mold master into the mold clay. So now I'm just excavating this kind of a hole that will accommodate half of that mold master. And this will give us a two piece mold. Here I'm placing the mold master pieces into the mold and pressing them down so that uh, all of the hook hangers and line tie are going to be halfway into the clay. That will make sure that this is halfway in. Thank you. 
Once I have the pieces securely in place, I'm going to fill out the voids around the mold master with mold clay and try to make sure that everything stays nice and flat. All right, now I'm adding pieces that will act as my pore holes, which is kind of fancy and a thing that I have started to do recently. And it will actually help you a little bit, at least when you pour the liquid plastic into the molds. And if the edges are not scraggly and uh, just horrible looking, uh, the plastic will actually flow into the molds much more nicely. At least that's what I think. One last thing to do before I start pouring the mold silicone into the mold box is to make locator holes, which will align the two molds together and will prevent them from moving when you actually start uh, pouring on the um, liquid plastic or anything else you want to pour in here. All right, for this mold, I'm gonna be using Mold Max 30, which is my go-to mold silicone. I've been using it for a long time now and it's just really reliable and just works. So it's a 10 to one ratio uh, silicone. And I'm gonna go with 400 grams, which will mean that I will have to add uh, 40 grams of um, accelerator. And with any silicone, you want to make sure that you uh, mix the accelerator and the silicone very thoroughly together so that they will actually harden later on. Some of you might remember from my previous videos where I make a mold box or mess with silicone of any kind, is that I usually pour a thin layer of silicone on top of the mold master first, let that cure for, uh, well, not cure, let that set for 10 minutes. That will help all of the bubbles burst around the uh, master. And then I will actually just add the rest of the mold silicone into the box. All right, so now that the uh, first half has cured, I'm just going to take out the uh, insert piece and the mold clay. And we'll basically repeat what I just did.
it's crucial to get all the mold clay out of the mold box because if you don't these will create voids later on and you will get horrible looking castings so make sure that you get all of the mold clay out of the mold box use Vaseline and I've been using Vaseline for I don't know how many years now it's been a long time let me tell you but uh, yeah I I've always liked to use Vaseline instead of those spray um, release agents I just feel like this is a little bit more um, potent uh, lack of a better word I guess but uh, it, yeah it just basically works uh, I know that there's some people out there who have some issues with this um, but I think it just comes down to the fact how thorough you are with covering every surface with this stuff. All right, so now that the other half of the mold silicone has cured, it's time to take the mold box apart. And this is always a nerve-wracking uh, process. Before pouring the rest of the silicone Even though I've been the doing this a long time, sure that sometimes the, you just um, mess open up areas and you get pinholes with, um, or a little bit of something mold like that. And it's because if really you don't do this, uh, the mold but silicone thankfully will this time around, every little gold crevice that you have in here. And happen, sometimes you don't always want what you want. Pouring the other side of the mold is pretty much exactly the same as I did on the first half. Um, I just always try to uh, keep in mind when I pour this that I don't pour directly onto the uh, mold master because that might create bubbles and you kind of don't want that to happen. So I usually always try to go on the sides or up area where uh, I don't have a piece of mold master sticking out. All right, so now that the other half of the mold silicone has cured, it's time to take the mold box apart. And this is always a nerve wracking uh, process. Even though I've been doing this a long time, sometimes you just mess up and you get pinholes or something like that. And it's really frustrating. But thankfully this time around, we were golden and nothing drastic happened, which is always what you want. I gotta say, um, it might have been a good idea to actually line the inner part of the mold box with um, something clear and uh, sleek, like packing tape for example. It might have been way more easier to tear this um, box apart if I did that, but I didn't, but in the end we were victorious nevertheless. This is the part that I really love. It's always so much fun opening up a new mold box and seeing what you did. And it's also very, very frustrating if something went wrong. But thankfully, like I said, we were golden and nothing drastic happened this time around, which I'm very happy about.
Here's a tip for you guys that I don't think I've ever shared before, which is dusting off your molds with baby powder. Now, why would you want to do that in the first place? Well, it helps with the longevity of your molds and keep them in rotation a lot longer. Secondly, it will help um, kind of act as a mold release agent in a way, and your castings will come out much more easier. And thirdly, it will help with bubble formations on the surfaces of your castings, which can be a real pain in the ass. All right, so now we're finally ready to do some castings. And I've actually already made a couple of prototypes and uh, tested out how much filler and how much resin I need in total. And of course, uh, where um, the weight is gonna be. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna share that with you guys because um, I do intend to sell these and I kind of want to keep that as a secret for now at least. So for this casting, I'm using a SmoothCast 300, which is a very fast acting um, liquid plastic. It has a demold time of 10 minutes, so you really have to hustle with this stuff. So, in order to help out with that, I usually always mix the uh, filler with the A side first, and then I pour on the, uh, the B side and start mixing vigorously for uh, roughly, I would say, 25 seconds. Um, usually you can start feeling that the uh, mixture is getting hot, and so that is the time to start pouring. And like I said, you really have to hustle with this stuff. Alright, so let's open up the mold box and see what we got here. Alright, so here I think you can see pretty nicely how the pin and those insert pieces work. So, firstly you have to take the pin out, and then you just kind of wiggle those um, Lexan insert pieces, because they do kind of um, want to stick, so a good trick here would be to use um, a mold release agent, like uh, for example what I used here is Vaseline. And of course you gotta love the perfect haulage which is, uh, yeah, so nice. All right, let's get started with the paint job. And the first color going in is going to be chrome. And uh, this time around, the paint job that I've chosen to do for this uh, swim bait is going to be sexy shad. I mean, I've made a whole bunch of different type of shad patterns before, but never a sexy one. So this is gonna be a first. The second color going in is going to be this aqua, which is a really nice shade, which I don't really have a lot of uh, use uh, cases. Uh, but this time around it definitely fit the bill and I do like how it looks. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go around the gill area and a little bit around the eye as well with this color. The third color going in is going to be this electric blue and I really love this shade. I use it as often as I can and it really goes well with yellow for example, which we're actually going to have on this bait too. However, I'm going to make this kind of like a gradient look on the back side of the bait and this is going to be the first color going in. To achieve that gradient ombre look on the back, I'm going to spray this uh, color shift purple paint on the very top side of the back. And I think this will help us achieving that uh, sexy look that we're uh, trying to achieve with this sexy shad paint job.
pretty much every single sexy shad uh, paint job that carries that moniker always has this yellow stripe on the flank. So that's what we're gonna paint next. shad paint job wouldn't be a shad paint job if there was no shad dot on the flank of the bait. So that's what we're painting next and I'm gonna do that with just plain black. All right, I'm sure that many of you noticed that, hey, you didn't do that wash technique that you do in your other videos. What's up with that? Why not? So that's what we're actually doing right now. I decided to wait a little bit so that I have the back color already in place because I think it will make the wash technique look a lot cooler. Continuing with the wash technique, I'm going to highlight some of the areas around the head with this pink to make it a look a little bit more alive. And um, yeah, basically exactly the same thing I did with the, um, the scales. Um, the ratio of um, water and uh, paint is roughly around, I would say, 75% paint and rest is like water. I wanted to add a little bit of randomness around the head of the lure with this uh, yellow. And I'm just going to kind of do this stippling technique and spray various areas and try not to overdo it, which is really difficult sometimes not to do. But uh, I think uh, I did a pretty decent job here um, making sure that I didn't overspray stuff. Our paint job is almost done. I just need to highlight the fins, which I'm gonna be doing with this uh, Wicked Black. As you can see, I made quite a few of these uh, shad swim baits, which will be available on my website uh, by the time this video drops, pretty much. At least that's what I'm aiming for. But yeah, anyways, uh, right now what I'm doing is I'm going to be gluing on the eyes with 5-minute epoxy. That's the first time I'm actually using 5-minute epoxy in this video. Shocking.
Now that the epoxy has cured, I'm going to pull out the pins that were holding the segments together and start to assemble these bad boys. The unfortunate thing about epoxy is that it kind of wants to go everywhere, and uh, which is a good thing, but in this case, uh, not so good because I have to trim a little bit of this stuff out and it would be nice if I didn't have to do this. But, you know, it is what it is. I still have to unclog the pinholes with a drill bit, which is not really that much of a big deal. I mean, it goes through pretty easily. When I was tuning these swim baits, I noticed that if I turn the screw eyes all the way down first and then go uh, three half revolutions, I would get the best swim out of these things. So that's what I'm doing right now. So now that I have tuned the distance of the screw eyes, it's super easy to just connect the pieces together because I took precautions in the mold and made sure that everything lines up perfectly. So that's uh, always a plus for me. Less headaches is always nicer. Alrighty, so now that the lures are done, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a pan here up close first and then we'll have a fuller look on the lures a little bit later on. So, enjoy. For those of you wondering about the specs of the lure, or well, lures actually, um, the weight is uh, 45 grams or 1.58 ounces, length is 15.5 centimeters or 6.1 inches. I'm sure you guys are also wondering, how do these things swim? I mean, they look good, but you know, I gotta know, how do they swim? So let's head out to the bathtub and let's have a look. As you can see, the body movement is quite spectacular and very fishy, if I say so myself. And I do. I'm very happy with how everything uh, came together on this uh, swim bait and uh, getting this done was a Herculean effort to be honest because I was working on this uh, on off hours after work and uh, Getting this thing done was a really big effort on my part. So hope you guys uh, Appreciate the effort that I put into these videos Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed the video like the video if you did subscribe to the channel for more content like this And also you can support me on patreon nowadays too. Like I mentioned earlier There's gonna be a longer version of this video post it in there. And finally, as a bonus, I wanted to include the other colors that I painted during this uh, swim bait session uh, for you guys to check out. So hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you on the next one, whenever that's going to be. I actually already have a good idea what I'm going to do next. It might be a swim bait. Not sure yet, but uh, we'll see.